let's get started here in this lecture, which is our lecture two, lecture number two, and technically our third lecture, if we count the lecture zero, we'll be talking about cyber attacks. Of course, the term cyber attack, uh, as it kind of implies it, the first uh, looking at, uh, it's a broad, it covers a broad area and it covers a broad or wide number of attacks and with different uh, kind of technology involved. So here in this lecture, we are going to uh, discuss the most important attacks that we know and we categorize them as cyber attacks. In general, uh, we have uh, two parts that of course I'm going to cover in this lecture. And if we find time, uh, depending on how fast we go, uh, I would also like to uh, point to uh, database attacks, which is in the part, uh, which is in the third part of the lecture. But in the first part, we'll talk about malicious software or something that we heard about as malware. Uh, we define the malware, the term malware, and we point to different uh, examples of malwares, including viruses, worms, trojans, and zombies or bots and, and other uh, examples of malwares. We uh, go into deep of each to see how, it, how they work. We review some examples of each. For example, we review one virus, one uh, uh, worm, and uh, we see how the code, of course, in the high level, we don't look at the exact code, but we see the high level code of, the, uh, high -level code of them. And uh, at the end, we'll talk about the countermeasures. And then in the second, second part of this lecture, uh, we will be talking about um, denial of service. Denial of service itself uh, is a type of um, attack, of course, that um, we can count it as um, any type of attack, but it has many, sub, many different subcategories. So we'll be talking about the denial of service subcategories. And then if you find time, like I said, uh, I would like to also talk about database attacks, for example, SQL injection attacks, distributed SQL injection attacks, and stuff like that. Okay, let's get started by defining the malware. Malicious software, or something that we call it malware, is arguably one of the most important or, or most significant categories of threats in computer systems. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a claim which is made uh, by National Institute of Standard and Technology in one of their documents uh, called SP800-83. And they define a malware in that document, in that release, uh, as what I, what I put it here. They say malware is a program that is interested into a system, uh, usually in a, uh, in a hidden way, in a covertly way, uh, in a covert way, uh, with the intent of compromising the confidentiality, integrity, or availability of the victim's data application or operating system. Or otherwise, they, they try to somehow disturb or uh, annoy the victim system or the victim person. So uh, what it is, it says it is a program. So a malware is a program uh, which is being inserted uh, in another program or in a system to, to somehow attack one of the pillars of the security that we said the confidentiality, integrity, and availability, we counted them as the traditional pillars of uh, security, and then we added two more to that, authenticity and accountability. Okay, where can we find malware based on this definition? Malware can be found in applications. You uh, download or you buy an application and you're gonna install that application in your, into your computer. And again, computer, when we say computer here, we are not only talking about desktop and laptop computers. We're talking about any type of computer. It might be a mobile computer. We, uh, we can find malware in websites and malware can be uh, kind of shooted toward us through some emails that we know them as spam emails. Okay, so uh, before getting into details of malware, uh, one thing that it's worth mentioning is who is developing malware and how can we uh, 
uh, expect the behavior of that the person or the team uh, who are behind developing malware. There is a general term in the security domain, hackers, that uh, it is defined like this, again, based on NIST documentation, they define hackers uh, as a person or organization or entity who enjoys exploiting and learning how to violate security regulations. Everyone, anyone who, ex, who enjoys or is interested to learning and, ex, and kind of after that probably violating security regulation is called a hacker. But uh, the important point that we, we need to consider is that uh, we have different types of hackers. In general, we have three types of hackers you see here. Uh, we have black hat hackers, gray hat hackers, and white hat hackers. Uh, a black hat hacker is a person or is a, or is a hacker uh, that tries to gain access to the system with no authorization to prove its technical skillness or prowess. So the main uh, person who develop uh, and deploy a malware in the security context are black hat hackers. And what, what their aim is, what their goal is, they try to exploit, what, exploit vulnerabilities in order to somehow attack the person, in order to uh, uh, disclose um, uh, some information. So they find vulnerabilities, they exploit vulnerabilities, but generally they do not attempt to disclose them. Because if I'm, it makes sense, if I'm an attacker and I'm, I'm going to attack you, if I find a vulnerability in your system, of course, it's, it would be beneficial for me to keep that secret. So black hat hackers, they find vulnerabilities, they exploit them, but they don't like to reveal or disclose the found vulnerabilities. Okay. In contrast to black hat hackers, we have white hat hackers that they are also called ethical hackers. The ethical hackers or white hat hackers, they are security experts or security professionals who are authorized to identify vulnerabilities in a computer system. And that might be through some risk assessment or through penetration testing, or they may do some ad hoc testing based on their expertise or whatever. But they, they try to find vulnerabilities. There is no exploitation uh, uh, kind of step. If they find any vulnerabilities, they of course reveal that vulnerability, that they disclose that vulnerability, they report the vulnerability to them. Uh, higher level of administrator in order to fix the vulnerabilities. So it is very clear that uh, white hat hackers are actually good for security of our systems. And even we have sometimes sometimes pay to hire some white hat hackers in order to they come and uh, deter, uh, kind of assess the security of our system, find the vulnerabilities, report the vulnerabilities, and they sometimes even have solutions or may suggest solutions how to fix those vulnerabilities. And the third uh, group or types of hackers are called gray hat hackers, who are some, some persons, some individuals in between. Of course, there are expert in individuals that they can find uh, or, or kind of discover vulnerabilities in a computer system, but they don't like to report that they don't like to uh, disclose the found vulnerabilities and this is the uh, kind of negative point negative negative point for the gray hat hackers they don't disclose or they don't report the vulnerabilities though uh, they are not going to use the vulnerabilities but they may in future gain some type of uh, money or reputation or whatever through finding that vulnerability. So they're called gray hat vulnerabilities. There is no attack. The main difference between gray hat hackers and black hat hackers is that there is no attack or exploit direct exploitation from the found vulnerabilities. They find vulnerabilities, they don't like to disclose it, but they, uh, they're not going to directly use it in order to attack our system but they may indirectly, for example, sell it to someone else. 
These are called gray hat hackers. Okay, uh, so uh, hackers, we talked about them. Uh, we should also know that what are the capabilities of hackers. First thing we, uh, we consider about hackers, of course, you may have some hacker, which is, for example, let's say a, a beginner hacker or a starter person who is not familiar with all uh, details and concepts of security. But in most cases, when we talk about hacker, when we, uh, when we say, okay, this system should be, uh, should be made secure against such and such type of um, uh, malicious activities or such and such a type of hackers, when we say such thing, we are assuming that hackers are fully expert and professional, professional persons. They know details of the system and they have access to many equipment, many devices, they have even labs, and they know, for example, details of the algorithms, for example, encryption algorithms or communication protocols that we have. They even may be able to find the passwords we have. These are the assumptions that we make uh, about hackers when we are talking about hackers. But let's uh, talk about it in details. First of all, we assume that hackers have access to protocol analyzer. What is a protocol analyzer? It means that they have access to some programs or some uh, hardware plus programs that they can uh, listen to different communications and they know the protocol so they understand the meaning of the packets or the data which is being communicated between the one computer and a different computer. So they can do uh, expert data sniffing. It means that they can listen to the data which is being transferred between our computer and other computer, and they can understand what this a specific portion of data, what this specific packet means. So that happens through having some uh, protocol analyzer. And there are devices and programs like this uh, available, people uh, can buy it. And of course, it's not easy to work with them. They need uh, expertise, but we assume that uh, hackers have access to devices like this and they know how to use it. The second thing is port scanner. Port scanner is also again a program that might be a, a single application you run on your computer or might be uh, run on a separate computer or a separate device. So we call it a tool which is being used to scan IP uh, devices, IP host devices in order to find the open ports. This is a slightly uh, into networks detail. So uh, you may, uh, those of you that you don't have enough ba required background in networking, you might uh, not know what is the port is or what the open port is. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about it, open it, but it means that, uh, in a high level description, it means that what are the uh, what are the virtual ways or what are the um, abstract ways that it, that the computer can be communicated over the network. They are called ports, and of course, some ports are open and some of them are uh, not open. The open ports are always uh, a way for attackers or hackers to use to penetrate to a system. Okay, we assume that our hackers do have access to port scanner and they know how to use port scanners. This uh, third thing is uh, operating system uh, scanner or fingerprinting scanner. Uh, the, the idea here is if you have a computer system and I'm a, hack and I'm a hacker, I'm gonna uh, attack your system. Of course, if I know the type of operating system you're using or the version of operating system you're using, it's going to help me. It's going to ease my time. Why? Because, for example, if I know that you are using, let's say, Windows 10, Home Edition, or whatever, I'm just giving as an example. I can, the minimum thing I can do, I can go online, search to see what are the vulnerabilities for Windows, uh, Windows 10 Home Edition. And I can try them one by one. And that, that smalls or shortens the search space for me. When I say search space, I mean that uh, I am, I, as a hacker, I have to search for different things to see what vulnerability, what vulnerabilities uh, your system uh, may have. So if I know the type of op operating system you are using, that information will, of course, shorten the search space and uh, will eventually help me toward attacking you easier. 
So again, we assume that our hackers do have access to OS uh, scanners and they can easily detect the type of uh, operating system that we are using in, in our computer. Uh, we do assume that attackers uh, have access to password crackers. Password crackers are software programs that try to uncover uh, forgotten or unknown passwords. In general, there are two ways. One is called brute force password attack. Brute force password attack means that they start just applying ev everything. From, for example, uh, if if the system doesn't have any limitation from one character password uh, from for all characters and then two character password, three character password and so on. This is called brute force. And of course it takes time. It, sometimes it might be years or tens of years or hundreds of years to reveal a, a password or discover a password. And the other one is this dictionary based uh, password crackers that they don't just randomly or sequentially count something and use it as a password, try it as a password. They try to look at some dictionaries, try, try to uh, deduct the password that you might be using. Anyway, we assume that the hackers have access to password crackers and they use it. And the last thing we assume about the uh, hackers is the key struck loggers or key loggers. Simply, they call sometimes key loggers. There are, again, softwares or, again, a combination of hardware software devices that can record any key that you hit on your keyboard. Something like this. This is, of course, not a real uh, key logger, but you can think about it something like this. If I have a device like this, like this which is interface between your keyboard, your keyboard and uh, your, for example, USB port, I can record whatever you hit as a user and save it into a log file and later I can process it using. So these are assumptions that we make about our uh, hackers and yes, in the hackers are this strong. You may argue, you may say that, okay, hackers, um, rare, in rare situation, we have hackers with this amount of uh, uh, capabilities. Yes, this is right. This is a rare situation, but uh, the thing is, for security, you need to prepare for the worst situation, for the worst case scenario. And the worst case scenario here is the case that the hacker or the attacker is the most strong person, has all capabilities and has all uh, equipment and devices in hand. Of course, um, let me give you an example. Of course, you have your uh, backup tire in, in the trunk of your car, and you may drive, let's say, 2,000 miles, and you never use it. But, but you cannot rely on that information. You can't say, okay, I have, uh, I've driven uh, 2,000 miles. I haven't used my backup tire. Let don't use it. Let don't carry it anymore. For the next 2,000 miles, I'm going to be safe because for the previous 2,000 miles, I was safe. No, that's not a uh, valid argument. The worst case thing may happen anytime. So that's the same thing here. Uh, we should prepare ourselves or we should make our system secure again the worst case situations or worst case uh, type of hackers. Okay, here is the terminology that we will be using in this lecture. I'm just going to pass it. Uh, we'll, we talk about details of each one, but this, is, this table somehow summarizes uh, all we are going to talk about. And you can uh, kind of use it as a uh, cheat sheet in order to help you. We'll talk about all of these uh, advanced persistent threat, adver, attack key, uh, backdoor, and, and all of them will be covered. Up. Yeah, here is the uh, last page of that table. Now I'm going to start with the type of malware. We've, we've defined malware, what are malware? Uh, portions of code or program which is, uh, which is being inserted into our computer system, into our application or our program or our computer in order to implement malicious activities uh, to break one of the security pillars. This was the definition I just reviewed. And now we, we are going to talk about uh, examples or cases of uh, malware. Uh, here I'm going to just give you quick 
uh, introduction about each, and then we go into details of each one uh, in the rest of this lecture. The first type of malware that we know, and uh, I'm sure that you have heard about them, uh, is called virus. What is a virus? A virus is actually a malicious piece of code. This piece, this term piece is here very important. Uh, later I return to that. A malicious piece of code that attaches to an, uh, to an executable file. This should be executable. Uh, I, I will fix this before uploading. Uh, that attaches to an executable file. And when it infected the executable file, now the ex executable file somehow serves as a platform for the virus. So whatever the executable file is capable of doing, uh, the virus will be capable of doing as well. And of course, another aspect of uh, viruses, which is important, is that they try to replicate themselves. They try to uh, copy themselves from one executable file to another one. They try to attach to as many as files they can. And they can uh, propagate through file transfer. For example, I have some uh, document on my flash disk and, I, and, I'm, and you are my co, co, uh, collaborator. I'm gonna share that document with you. I give you my flash disk just to make it easy. I don't wanna email you, for example, let's say. It, it, was, it used to be one of the uh, most important ways, but now uh, with the more usage from emails and uh, electronic ways for transferring data, that's less common. But I give my uh, shared drive or flash disk to you, you attach it to, you plug it into your computer. And if that's infected by a virus, your computer or files of your computer now might be infected as well. Or of course, another way is through, through network communication. The second type of uh, malware that we'll be talking about them uh, is called Worm. A Worm is a computer program that runs independently. So now it, make, uh, it makes sense that I said, piece of code is important when you define the virus versus Worm. A virus is a piece of code that attaches to a different program. However, a Worm is a malicious program that runs independently. It doesn't need uh, it doesn't need to use a different program as a platform or as a carrier. It pro propagates to, uh, to uh, a complete working version of itself onto a, onto a different uh, host on a network or again through file transfer. And it exploits vulnerabilities in the target system or tries to capture uh, uh, authorization credentials, which, mean, which means that it uh, violates the, it exploits the vulnerabilities and tries to, for example, in some cases, try to discover uh, your username and password. Okay. The next type of uh, malware that we'll be talking about is called hard uh, Trojan horses or Trojan horse. Uh, which uh, is slightly different uh, with uh, virus and uh, worm. And what it is, it is a program, uh, it is a computer program or, a, or an application that we uh, are persuaded that this is a good thing for us. It has some useful functionality and we trust that useful functionality and we install it in our computer but in addition to that useful functionality, they also have some hidden parts uh, which are malicious and try to evade, uh, try to violate the security regulation, try to evade our system and violate security regulation. But like the, the name comes from that uh, Trojan horse that uh, was used in one of the ancient wars between Rome and, uh, and the other country. Uh, so uh, you trust on the, on the appearance, on the kind of information that you get from the uh, seller or from the uh, distributor or provider. They tell you that, okay, this is a good application. It, it uh, performs such and such functionality for you. And you say, okay, this is good, I need it. And you install it. But you are not aware that there are also some hidden parts that they try to do malicious activity against you. Again, they exploit legitimate 
uh, authorization of the system entirely. Uh, and they, um, they try to break the security pillars uh, as much as they can. One interesting about uh, Trojan horses is that these days, uh, we also hear about hardware version of Trojan horses. Uh, what it means is that uh, the Trojan horses nowadays are not only limited to program computer or applications. We can also uh, find hardware equipment which they have uh, um, Trojan horses. I'm gonna give you an example. I, I heard this from one of my friends. I, I'm not sure about, uh, but he told me that when he talks about something to his wife, uh, later, for example, a few hours later, uh, they see uh, relevant ads on their Instagram and Facebook pages. Okay, how this thing may uh, might be possible? One thing that I can um, assume is that the microphone on the cell phone, uh, on their cell phone, is somehow or sometimes used uh, by the um, by the system in order to uh, collect some signals and listen to the signals. Of course, the device that we have bought, assuming that this, assuming that their uh, their claim is correct, assuming my analysis is correct, the cell phone that uh, we have uh, bought or they have bought, they have bought it as a as a specific device with some functionalities. And those functionalities are there. The cell phone works. You can, you can use it to call someone. You can use it to text someone. And all other functionalities that we expect from a normal cell phone, they are there, they work. But other than that, there are some hidden functionalities that we are not aware of them. So that's uh, an example of hardware Trojan course in a computer system or a computer device. There are more examples of hardware Trojans that uh, you can uh, go online and search for them if you're interested. The fourth type of uh, malware that we're talking about uh, in this lecture are called zombies or bot. And uh, there are programs which is installed uh, on, in, on an infected machine, but they are not targeting that as a specific machine. They are tar targeting other machines over the network. So the difference between uh, bot and um, other types of uh, malware that we have talked about them so far, number one to three, uh, virus, worm, and trojans, is that all of these first three, they are uh, targeting the same machine that they're uh, on it. In fact, the host machine is the victim machine. But in uh, zombie or bot, the host machine is different than the victim machine. And the last type of the malware that we'll be talking in this lecture is called advanced persistent threat or APTs. APTs, uh, um, um, when, I, when we reach them, I'll, uh, I'll explain, of course, I'll be going into details of them, but the major difference of AP, uh, APTs than the other four is that they're persistent or continuous attempts from one person, one individual, or one group of, uh, or one organization that they are persistently or continuously they are trying to attack some victim device or victim person. In all of the mentioned four previous uh, malwares, there is no persistency. It means that the virus comes. If the virus is capable of attacking your, uh, the victim machine, or the host machine, it does that. Otherwise, it just propagates and goes to another computer. That's it. There is no try, there is no multiple trial from the virus or war. Uh, they just come. And uh, in fact, uh, in fact, there is no difference for a virus if they infect my computer or your computer. They just want to make a, a kind of problem for everyone. There is no priority over people uh, for a virus, or there is no priority or preference for the attack um, system uh, for viruses. But there is such thing for APTs. APTs are designed to attack a specific device, a specific person, and the attack is going to be 
uh, continued until accomplishing that uh, goal or achieving the, uh, if, which in fact means implementing the attack. Okay, that's the major difference between APTs and other type of malware that we've talked about. Okay, uh, this, uh, of course, uh, what I talked about, uh, these five types of malware is just introduction about each. Um, later, after I, um, I talk about classification of these malware, we go into the details of each. And like I said, we'll even see some examples of some of them. Uh, and we see how they exactly work. But uh, before that, uh, I'm gonna give you a classification of malware. Of course, uh, we classify malware. There, there might be multiple classif classification for malware, but two major classifications are here. One is based on the uh, type of spread or propagation that we see in the malware. How the malware is supposed to propagate or reach uh, to the uh, target system or the victim system. Based on this, we can, we can of course uh, classify the malware. And the second thing is the type of active, malicious activities or actions. Sometimes we call it malicious activity, sometimes we call it action, or sometimes we call it payloads. Malicious activity, action, and payload are all synonym terms. Okay. Based on the malicious activity or based on the payload also, we can classify the malware. Other less uh, kind of noun classification for malware are based on if they need a host program or not. For example, the virus does need a uh, host program because they're parasitic code, they're a piece of code, they're not a full uh, malicious code, but worms uh, in contrast, they don't need. Uh, so worms are independent codes or program. Uh, do they replicate itself or not? For example, uh, hard Trojans, they don't replicate it, uh, itself. Hard, either hardware or software Trojans, they are just there, they don't replicate, they, they don't populate. But viruses and worms, they replicate, they try to uh, get uh, more of them in terms of number and spread to more computers. Okay, about the propagation mechanism, the first uh, kind of classification, uh, we have three types of uh, propagation. Okay, we have a propagation through infection of existing content, uh, which is used by viruses to spread to other systems, uh, which means that uh, they, they infect uh, some content of some files and try to uh, use the authority and capability of those files, especially if the file is executable, and try to uh, uh, replicate themselves to that. So this is, used, uh, this is used by wires. We also have the propagation uh, through exploiting software vulnerabilities which is used by worms. So the worms uh, extract the vulnerabilities of the software program and try to propagate through the vulnerabilities. And the third type of uh, propagation for malware is called social engineering attacks, uh, which is, for example, used by Trojans. They try to convince you that there is no, uh, there is no such uh, kind of uh, dangerous thing in this program. This program, this application is all safe. You can use it. So these are called social engineering uh, tricks or social engineering attacks. It might be through some, uh, for example, email. Some email comes to you and that email uh, try to deceive you and uh, try to push you to do something. So these are uh, three ways of uh, propagation in uh, malware. Based on the activity, malicious activity, or the payload of the malware, we can see each of these or combination of these um, activities uh, in a malware. A malware can tr uh, quite try to corrupt uh, the system or data files of the system. The malware can try to uh, steal some services 
for example, you, uh, you have an internet connection, the malware tries to use your internet connection. Or you have a CPU, the malware comes and try to just use a portion of the time of your CPU in order to compute something. This is a kind of very recent malware uh, which relates somehow to the cryptocurrencies. You know, cryptocurrencies, in order to exploit cryptocurrencies, you need to run some big uh, processes in your computer in order to find some numbers, find some big numbers. And those big numbers are in fact, uh, since they're not easy to achieve, they're valuable. Uh, so if I can somehow, and everybody has at least multiple computing devices that sometimes they might not be used by that person. If I write something, just send a portion of my computing on, on to your computer and use your, your device, your electricity, your equipment, your problem in order to run my application. Of course, I can achieve more, I can exploit more cryptocurrencies or I can exploit cryptocurrencies in a faster rate. So I'm in fact stealing your service which is like I said, being used by bots. Uh, they try to use the target system in order to do something. We have theft of information from the system. This is another type of uh, um, uh, activity or um, payload that malwares can do. They just come and try to steal information, valuable information. That valuable information might be, for example, your uh, account number and your routing number. And, any other information like that, your password. And finally, they may try to steal, uh, this is also a uh, malicious activity. They may try to keep themselves uh, hide or kind of uncover. This is a malicious activity. If there is a process or there is an application in my computer, which is not, uh, which of course, if I know I, I'm not gonna let it, let it stay anymore, one malicious activity might be trying to keep that uh, program or that application uh, hidden. So a virus, a worm, or any other type of malware, they, one activity that they, uh, they're designed to do, they're supposed to do is that is to keep themselves uh, hidden. And that, that's a part of their malicious activity that they do. Okay, um, another uh, side point before getting into viruses, I guess probably we can today start, start talking about viruses and get into some details of viruses. Uh, before getting into that, I'm also going to talk about attack kits. What is attack kits and how is uh, kind of putting more pressure on the sense of uh, having uh, or developing security solutions. Initially, it used to be very difficult to develop and deploy a malware. If I, if I were a uh, software programmer or a, hard, or a computer engineer and I wanted to design a, a, a malware, I needed to be a very specialized and very technical person. I had to knew the whole, uh, a specification of the system. I uh, had to be a very great programmer in low level programming, C assembly and stuff like that. So it was not easy to become a, a malware developer. It wasn't easy to become a hacker. You, you had to be an advanced software programmer. But starting from 90s, uh, some, some people, some uh, programmers, they, they developed some type of programs that the program was intended to, to create viruses by itself. They were called virus creation toolkits. And the virus creation toolkits that later they called it crimeware, uh, they are basically programs that they give opportunity to uh, even unexpert people to develop and deploy malwares. They include variety of propagation mechanism and payloads and different modules that even novice person and non-expert person can use them. You just need to click on some buttons. This is one of them, in fact. Yeah, these are two examples that I just listed them here, Zeus and Angular. 
And here is the interface of the Zeus. Of course, I'm not recommending you to install it to find it. I, I even uh, don't have it on my computer. But this is the uh, interface of the Zeus. You can see that uh, you can uh, kind of define different uh, uh, configuration in the setting for the virus that you are generating. Or you can uh, put the config in a text file. And of course, there is a, a kind of syntax for that. You define the detail of the virus you like. You put it on that config file. And then you upload it in on this tool. And the tool generates the virus for you. So you even don't have to do anything. You just use the application. So of course, it's very, very easier than uh, sitting down and writing the whole virus from scratch. And the variations, the important thing here is this, the variation, different variations of malware produced by novice users or novice person now made it uh, very difficult for uh, defending persons or defending systems. Because I used to, for example, uh, I, I had to deal with, let's say, uh, 10, 100, 1,000 different viruses from different uh, technical persons, but now it just exploded. It, it came, uh, the number is something, for example, a million different types of viruses. So it's going to be very difficult to detect them and to uh, defeat uh, against them. Okay. Uh, the next site thing before getting into virus is called uh, attack source, uh, which is very uh, important. Again, uh, it, uh, it used to be uh, malware used to be supported or sponsored by individuals. One individual technical person uh, out of curiosity or out of interest or out of some malicious objectives, they uh, used to support developing a malware, a virus or a war. They used to see it put time for, for example, a few months and uh, develop the malware and then propagate it. But now it's a different story. The source has changed from individuals to organized attacking systems or organized attack sources. For example, uh, there are some governments that they support uh, developing malware or viruses or worms, different type of malware because of political motivations or political uh, reasons. We have crimi criminals groups or people that they just want to use the malware as a tool, as a device in order to attack uh, another group of criminals or governments or police or uh, states or whatever. Organized crime, organizations that they, they, uh, that they sell their services to companies and nations, or some organization and national government agencies. So we have, uh, we see that the uh, malware creation, malware development, and malware deployment uh, is now a matter of wider communities and more communities, more individuals and organizations are interested in. So it makes the situation more complicated and make the defense system uh, to be more complicated and kind of increases the need for uh, having more advanced and more complicated computer in defending systems. Yeah, and uh, because of uh, all these sources of attacks and uh, individuals or organizations interested into malware, we have a large underground economy in the malware industry that they sell attack kits, they develop customized malware, they access to compromised hosts, and they kind of sell stolen information. And all of these, uh, there is a big uh, underground economy, which is of course uh, is illegal, but it's there. And mm, many criminal uh, people or individuals are involved. Okay. Based on this, now let's get started with the first type of malware we talked about. We said that viruses are a piece of software. They're not a full program that they try to infect the program or multiple programs. 
they modify them to include, they modify the program in order to copy a, um, copy a virus and attach the virus code to the program code. And of course they replicate and goes uh, to infect other uh, files or other contents and they easily spread through file sharing or network environment. This is uh, what we talked about. Okay, uh, the, um, the important thing here is the level of access that the virus might have. When a virus attaches itself to an executable program or executable file, the virus can, uh, can do anything the program is permitted to do. It means that the privilege or the level of access that the virus might have equals to the level of access that the program has. So for example, if, if I write a uh, virus for, let's say Microsoft Word, that virus would have access to my printer as well because the Microsoft Word has access to printer. That virus would have access to my drive as well because the Microsoft Word has access to my drive. It can open files, create files and save files. So you see how uh, kind of dangerous it is. Okay, and uh, a, another uh, important point about viruses to keep in mind is that they're, uh, they're designed, they're developed specifically for a given operating system for a hardware for an application. The virus you write or someone write, let's say, uh, for example, for Microsoft Word, Windows edition, let's say version uh, 2021, that's exactly for that uh, version, that type for that and that host machine. It doesn't work on a Linux machine. It doesn't work on a Microsoft uh, Mac version. Because of course it uh, needs the details and weaknesses of that application. So it doesn't work for anything else. Okay. Uh, we talked about viruses, now talk about the components of viruses. When we talk about the virus in general, uh, which components uh, do we expect to see? The first part is the infection mechanism, which means that how the virus is supposed to spread and propagate toward that mm, target application. This is also sometimes referred to as infection vector how the uh, virus is supposed to uh, propagate. It might be through network or it might be through, for example, for our example case at the Microsoft Word, uh, there are some viruses for Microsoft Word that they propagate through uh, docx file. We'll talk about them. We'll talk about them. They are called uh, microviruses. Uh, you have some wires that they uh, propagate to dark files and they attach to Microsoft for that after that. The next component we see uh, is a trigger component. The trigger component in fact says, okay, uh, I, I've written a virus, I've developed the virus, the virus now is attached to the target application on the target device. And uh, the, the virus now seeks a specific condition, a specific situation, or a specific event to happen in order to start its malicious activity or in order to start the payload. What it means, it means that for some viruses, they don't start malicious activity right after they attach to the program or to the application. They wait for some, some moment, for some, it might be even some days, and uh, something which is called logic bomb. They seek for a specific uh, circumstances. And then after that circumstance ha has happened, the virus start uh, its payload. And the payload is the part that, of course we see in viruses, and it is the part that performs the actual malicious activity. And of course, uh, we need to, uh, look at the what, what the, or we need to be uh, careful about what the virus is going to do. This is, this is something beside the spreading. Virus is spread already, is attached to our system or our application already, and now is the time that uh, start the kind of the malicious activity, start to violate uh, one of our security policies. 
Okay, based on uh, what I mentioned, we can define uh, multiple phases for uh, viruses. One phase uh, is called dormant phase. In the dormant phase, virus is attached. We are talking about a virus. We are talking about the phases of a virus, which is already propagated, which is already attached to an application in our computer. So we are assuming that we have a computer which is already infected by a virus. After being infected, there are four steps that we can see. There are four phases that we can see uh, in the virus. The first is a dormant phase, which means that the virus has already infected our application, but it, is, it keeps itself hidden. It's not doing anything. The virus is idle. The virus is seeking that specific event. For example, the, some viruses, they want to start at the first of the uh, calendar month. They, they wait until the calendar month starts. So this is called dormant phase. Of course, not all viruses have the dormant for, uh, phase. Some viruses, they just start their malicious activity right after they uh, infected the system, but some of them, they do have the, uh, the dormant phase. After the dormancy, uh, they go to the triggering phase, which means that the virus is now being activated to perform each to perform its uh, malicious functions of, uh, or payload. And like I said, the triggering, uh, if, we if we do have the doorman, it means that there should be a one event or a combination of events in our computer system that triggers the uh, virus. If there is no doorman, it means that the virus just triggers itself after uh, propagation. The, uh, the, third first, the third phase is propagation, which means virus after triggering, after being active, the virus starts trying to copy itself to other programs and other files. Uh, we later talk about this fact that some viruses, uh, they copy they copy themselves, they replicate themselves. Let me put it this way, they replicate themselves, but it doesn't mean that they copy themselves. They make some changes before uh, the actual uh, copy operation. But, in, but what it is in general, we call it replication. The virus tries to replicate itself, try to uh, get more number of its spread over the computer and try to infect more and more files and more and more applications. Uh, and after the propagation phase, now it uh, becomes to the execution phase. This is the last phase execution. The, uh, the virus is being executed, the malicious activity is being done, and the corruption is or the damage is going to happen. Of course, after the virus execution phase, there might be some uh, uh, impact on our system. Uh, I remember uh, I, I uh, used to have a virus uh, sometimes in my Windows 95. You may not, you might not use uh, that, but I have used that in Windows 95. And the virus used to work like this, that you, you, you use your computer for a while. And after that, uh, the computer just out of no reason, uh, it just resets itself. That's it. That was the uh, kind of the action of that, the execution phase of that virus. And of course, they start the execution once they infected as much as they can in the system. So they first propagate and then execute. Because the moment they start execution, the user realizes that, okay, something is wrong. Something on this computer is not right. And that uh, the first thing comes into mind is that, okay, this system is infected by something. Uh, so they first propagate and then they start uh, the actual malicious activity of the payload. A, a subcategory of viruses, which are called microviruses or scripting viruses, this is a definition by uh, NISC. It says a virus that attaches itself to a document not to an executable like application or executable file, and uses the microprogramming capabilities of the documents 
uh, in order to uh, execute and propagate. You know, micros, we have micros in um, not all, but in some uh, files, for example, in Microsoft, uh, in al almost all of the Microsoft uh, products, Microsoft applications, like for example, uh, I mean Microsoft Office suite, in Microsoft Word, Microsoft Excel, Microsoft PowerPoint, you can write micros in order to, uh, in order to do something on behalf of the user. You don't wanna, for example, open a file and repeat something uh, for 100 times or 1000 times. You just ask, you just write a micro code and that micro code in fact is a part of your document, is a part of your Excel file, for example. And it, it performs some calculation on the Excel data for you. Uh, and it just, for example, makes it easier for you. Instead of you coming and adding up some columns, averaging some columns, and then squaring something, uh, find the maximum, you can write all of them as a micro. And the moment you open the file, all of those will be executed and uh, you don't need to do them uh, manually. But this is, of course, this is of course something that saves time for us, but it might be a place for uh, malware developers. They write the malwares in the micro portion uh, and add it to the, uh, to the, for example, Excel file. And now the Excel file is uh, infected by the micro virus and everyone that opens it, it goes to the, uh, uh, Microsoft Excel memory portion, and it can and kind of infect all other uh, Excel files that you open before you close the Excel file. So it they can propagate from one Excel file to another one. Yeah, there are uh, the kind of import, important thing about micro uh, viruses or scripting viruses that they are platform independent because. Uh, they are being attached to your Excel file, not the Excel application. They, in fact, uh, they infect documents, not the executable part. They're easily uh, spreadable. Yeah, and that's why you should be more careful about them. And uh, they, in fact, the user document and uh, not the uh, system program. Uh, because of that traditional file system access control are limited because mm, they are not affecting the uh, program. Uh, if, if I'm a malware developer and I'm going to write something to, uh, to infect, uh, let's say, uh, Microsoft Excel, I need to mm, go to some privileged levels of the Windows kernel in order to add my code to the Microsoft Excel application. But a, an Excel file, which is uh, a personal Excel file, uh, a, a, I mean, an Excel a spreadsheet, uh, that doesn't need any, any type of privilege by the Windows operating system. So it, it would be very easier to attach my malware to an Excel file. And, it's, and from the security standpoint, it would be more difficult to defeat that. Yeah. Okay, here is... Uh, one uh, sample of a microvirus, which is called Melissa microvirus, it, uh, it spread it on March 26th of 1999, and the target was Microsoft Word and Outlook based systems. Here is the code. Uh, here's the app. Of course, here's the pseudo code, the high level code of that. Uh, look at this. It, it starts like this. It disabled. Uh, it disables micro menu and security features of the micros. Uh, when it says it disables, it means that uh, there are some menus in Microsoft that said you can go and do it manually by your, uh, your by, by hand, by your mouse, or you can write a micro to do that for you. So it is doable by micro to turn off the security features. If called from the user document, copy the micro to the template, Otherwise, again, copy the, doc, uh, in the uh, micro code into the document being open. So anyway, it, it adds the micro to the, to the open file. So it propagates from one file to another file. 
and it puts the term militia, militia in the registry and it sends the same thing to at least 50 of addresses in your output. Send email to the addresses with currently, with currently infected document attached. So it is how it works. It infects um, your open document file and it send, sends it to 50 of your uh, addresses in your output address book. And again, like I said, it creates a, uh, a, a registry, create a registry term in the uh, registry of your windows. And this way you see that how easy it uh, propagates to many people uh, as a microvirus. Okay. I think uh, that should be enough for today for this recording. I will be talking about virus classification in the uh, next uh, recording. Let us uh, use the attendance code for today as um, Melissa, the way you see here, with the same spelling. Thank you and have a good day.